Um, first, I'd like to thank the Department of Africana Studies here at the University of Michigan Flint for inviting me to introduce our guest speaker. This is quite an honor, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm honored to introduce the dist our distinguished guest, Dr. Amal Hassan Falala. Professor Falala is a faculty member at the University of Michigan Flint in the departments of, three departments, of anthropology, women's studies, African American, and African studies, all three. Uh, Dr. Falala received her doctorate in anthropology at Northwestern University over in Chicago, uh, a master's degree in anthropology at the University of Khartoum in Sudan, where she also earlier received her bachelor's degree in both economics and anthropology. Uh, Dr. Falala has also earned her certificate in population and development from Harvard University. Professor Falala has served as a Women's Studies Director at, of Graduate Studies at the University of Michigan, and as well as she has served as a consultant for the Danish Red Cross in Khartoum, uh, uh, Khartoum Sudan. Professor Falala is the author of countless, numerous books, including, <laughs> including Embodying Honor, Fertility, Forgiveness, and Regeneration in Eastern Sudan, Gendered Insecurities, Health and Development in Africa, co-edited with Howard Stein, and most recently, available outside, is Branding Humanity, Competing Narratives of Rights, Violence, and Global Citizenship. Dr. Falala is author of numerous articles, book chapters, and reviews. She's also published a collection of poetry and short stories. Uh, Professor Falala has also presented her work at annual meetings, including the African Studies Association, the American Anthropological Association, the Association of Women Historians, the Population Association of America. Professor Falala has also been invited to speak at such universities as Arizona State University, University of Los Angeles, University of California, Los Angeles, the New School, American University, University of Chicago, as well as a number of NGOs, including the Sudanese American Women's Organization and Oxfam America's International Women's Day. So the University of Michigan Flint is in good company, I believe. In the, in the introduction to her newest ethnography, Professor Falala writes that this book, quote, examines the transnational transformation of Sudanese nation state before its division into South and South, uh, to, into Sudan and South Sudan in July 9th, 2011. Through her multifaceted research methodology that involves interviews and interactions traced through the threads of a transnational social network, Professor Falala shows, quote, how national and transnational narratives about violence, rights, and humanity circulate and how they shape and re Territorize ethnic identities, disrupt meanings of national belonging, and rearticulate notions of solidarity and global affirmation, affiliation. From this larger body of scholarship, we are fortunate to have her have the opportunity this afternoon to hear Professor Falala speak more specifically about humanity and violence against women. Therefore, without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to present Dr. Aman. Hassan Falala. Thank you so much um, to all of you for being here today. I'm glad we're, we're not having a snow day. Um, and uh, thank you. I mean, uh, I am really honored uh, to be here, celebrate the Africa Week with you and the um, uh, Black History Month. So great thanks to the African Studies for this generous invite. Um, I've been to Flint maybe seven years ago to do part of the field work for this book, so it's good to come back. Um, so before I begin, uh, I just want to uh, give a, a brief background about my talk today. Uh, so as you know, uh, Professor Roy said, I mean, the, the, the talk is based on my, uh, my book, uh, Branding Humanity. Uh, which is based on extensive field work that I did uh, with uh, Sudanese activists and their allies uh, in the United States, uh, in the Sudans, and in the on online. 
so during the time uh, of my field work, uh, much of it I, um, I did before the country divided into two nation states, so now we have Sudan and South Sudan. The debate over uh, Sudanese ethnic identities and the future of the Sudan was very tense, uh, particularly among uh, different uh, elites, including the Islamist, including secularist, including uh, human rights and humanitarian uh, activist. Um, um, so I look in the book. I look at how Sudanese ethnic identities are reproduced and reconstructed in human rights and humanitarian campaigns in the United States, and most significantly. I look at how the conflicts in the Sudan were framed uh, around dichotomous um, uh, categories and dichotomous identity, identities. And I'm sure you remember the whole kind of construction of these identities around the Muslim Arab North fighting the um, African Christian uh, South, uh, in the case of South Sudan, or you know, the Arab Muslims fighting the black Muslims in the, in the case of Darfur. So in the book, I show how diaspora Sudanese, especially secular activists, uh, and those in the Sudan, how they responded to these debates around identity, around humanity, and around citizenship rights. So for my talk today, uh, I will use a gender lens uh, to elaborate on these tensions and these debates, um, and how identity politics was mobilized uh, in these different campaigns. And I'm going to focus on two stories, two stories of Sudanese women, uh, one from Darfur and one from Northern Sudan. And I'm sorry I'm using the same uh, kind of divisive uh, identity formation, because this is how they were represented in these, uh, in these narratives. So I'm going to start with this slide. It's a, you know, uh, there is a lot in it in terms of dates and histories, but I want to um, you know, kind of uh, draw your attention to the slide because there are some dates that I'll continue to refer to in my talk, especially you know, 2003 when the Darfur um, uh, conflict uh, escalated. Uh, then the peace agreement between Northern Sudan and South Sudan in 2005, which ended the war between the two countries uh, and ultimately led to the, uh, the uh, creation of the Republic of South Sudan in 2011. So these are the most important dates that I'll refer to. So I begin with, with this, the first story, okay? So on Human Rights Day, December 10th, 2008, a Darfurian woman using the pseudonym Halima Bashir entered the Oval Office to meet with President George Bush. Halima appeared before the White House breast, uh, before the White House breast, wearing a colorful Sudanese body wrap. We call it toque. So her face was veiled to protect her identity because she feared that the Sudanese authorities might harm her family in Darfur. Halima presented President Bush with her recently published biography titled Tears of the Desert, a memoir of survival in Darfur, which she co-authored with well-known British author and journalist Damien Lewis. So in her book, Halima details her rape and abuse by the Khartoum government militia in Darfur when she worked as a volunteer medical doctor in the refugee camp. So during the White House press, uh, during the conference, uh, Halima was introduced by President Bush as a human rights activist and described by him as a good soul who brought first-hand accounts to what life is like in Darfur. So according to President Bush, and I'm quoting here, Halima witnessed violence, deprivation, and she carries a message of a lot of people who want our help. I assure that in spite of our economic difficulties, our aid will continue to flow. We will use our influence to make sure 
that aid gets to the people of Darfur. So President Bush took the opportunity to, com to commend the United Nations and the African Union on their joint efforts to send troops to Darfur and urged for more expediency in other UN peace processes related to the conflict. He warned President Bush, uh, President, uh, well, that too. He warned President Bashir of the Sudan that he would not escape accountability for committing crimes against humanity in Darfur. He also announced the appointment of a special envoy to the Sudan and urged the international community to put more pressure on the Sudanese government and the warring parties to resolve the conflict in Darfur and to facilitate the work of humanitarian agencies there. And I quote uh, President Bush talking, the urgency of the situation, Bush declared, is never more apparent when I had the honor of visiting with this brave soul, end of quote. Halima then thanked the president and added that the crisis had been going on for five years, noting that the people in the refugee camps could not wait any longer. She stressed that the International Criminal Court, the ICC, uh, the ruling of the court against the Sudanese president should be upheld to stop the genocide and atrocities in the region. And she said, I am very happy because Darfur, and that, uh, because Darfur, Darfur victims and their voices are now heard in the White House to the American people and to the whole world. Halima's story is one of the many master narratives and, uh, and counter narratives that circulated by many human rights and humanitarian actors and their Sudanese allies during the tense debate about Sudanese conflict and the future of the Sudan, especially before the signing of the peace agreement in 2005. And of course, before the division of the country. There are so many uh, stories and so many books written about that, and I, uh, you know, this slide is just a representation of this. So these master narratives worked as effective techniques to point blame at the acts of the Islamist regime and to highlight its inhumane practices against minority citizens. Unlike the infantilized stories of the lost boys of the Sudan that most of us are familiar with, the stories of women, such as Halima, project a feminized narrative of vulnerability and suffering that depicts Sudan as an ailing nation state. So I, I engage here um, a growing body of scholarship that examined the power of narration, the power of stories in the social sciences, especially in anthropology since the 80s. Uh, many anthropologists um, have directed attention to the importance of writing with our subjects in order to capture their agency, in order to capture their voice, in order to capture their life histories. And there is a lot of literature that show how storytelling has been used in various political campaigns to mobilize American citizens around both uh, conservative and progressive agendas. So stories belong to the realm of the moral, they belong to the realm of the emotional, and also the realm of the imaginary, and they provide an invaluable counterpart to the forms of knowledge privileged in official and academic accounts. So I add here, I add to this kind of analysis that these kinds of stories also relate to the domain of audio politics, where meanings are transmitted through particular media and devices 
to make people, especially politicians, policy makers, and activists, make them listen, make them respond and intervene. And here is a, a very powerful uh, slide of uh, Colony briefing uh, President Obama about Sudan. So in the case of the Sudanese conflicts and their representation in various American mainstream media and other counter publics, stories of women and children circulate in different forums to communicate the suffering and exclusion of minority citizens. These stories are then taken, are, sorry, so these stories are often taken out of their intricate social political context and present it to us uh, in familiar, emotional, and dramatic guises. So in my analysis uh, in the book, I trace the production and the circulation of these ethnicized and feminized master narratives, like that of Halima, and examine the ways in which they have also inspired protest and counter narratives among many Sudanese social actors and activists in the United States, uh, also in the Sudan and uh, in other places in the diaspora. And I show how this form of storytelling has been facilitated by the emergence of Sudanese online media, such as Sudanese Online and Sudan Nile. And these are big website um, uh, media. Um, that a lot of activists um, kind of uh, depend on. So many stories, many stories that are published in mainstream uh, media find their way to Sudanese online, uh, to also to digital and print media. And from there, they get mobilized by different Sudanese social actors, activists, and journalists to negotiate and protest the exclusive politics of nationality in the name of an imagined uh, transnational humanitarian order. So in, in many publics where these, where, where these debates and contestation take place, I also examine how victims of conflicts are educated to become human rights and humanitarian activists themselves. So this education entails that these victims have to master uh, how to tell their own stories of suffering as part of this process of becoming leaders and becoming role models, uh, uh, which you know at the end I think it's you know uh, socializing them to becoming global citizens. So to come back to Halima's uh, master narratives that I you know started with. And to talk about its production and its circulation, I would like to uh, highlight that Halima's story um, is a production of One World, which is an American publishing house, and is a narration and translation of British author Damien Lewis. Now, Damien has gained fame co-authoring translated memoirs of suffering based on his experience covering various conflict zones in Africa and in the Middle East. This genre positioned him as the narrator translator of individual men and women's dramatic tales of suffering and survival. So these stories of suffering present the protagonist as heroes and as heroines also as role models and as iconic symbols of bravery, healing, and anti-corruption. So in the most triumphant cases, the, uh, these heroes and heroines, they become humanitarian and human rights activists themselves. And their stories serve, as I mentioned before, as audio political devices that help activists, politicians, and policy makers respond, act, and intervene. Furthermore, through his own acts of witnessing, translating, and co-narrating, Damien Lewis himself become a hero. 
He's a renowned journalist. He's award-winning screenwriter, uh, a best-selling author. He's endowed with fame and the power to make the international community listen. And this is clear in Lewis, Lewis's marketing website, where he talks about how he endured hardship in Africa to get these stories to his audience, including that he contracted bizarre African diseases, such as uh, flesh-eating bacteria and other diseases that I don't recognize. But the reader is always assured that Lewis survived. He survived all of that and continued to report. This is, of course, you know, a very uh, effective marketing strategy that makes his books very popular, especially because they are written in a in very simple, very dramatic narrative style. So, for instance, in Tears of the Desert, Halima's book, uh, Halima is represented um, uh, uh, in a very dramatic way. Uh, she is a medical doctor, a graduate of the University of Khartoum, which also is my alma mater. She, um, Halima uh, told the story of her traumatic rape by the Khartoum security forces in Darfur. Because of this experience, she was smuggled by an agent through Khartoum Airport into London. In London, she joined her husband and cousin, his name is Sharif, who himself is a renowned Darfurian rebel leader. By the end of the story, we are told that Halima was finally granted asylum with other members of her family and now lives uh, with her husband and two sons in London. So after the release of Tears of the Desert, Halima appeared in various high-profile media. She was wearing a black burqa most of the time and also wearing big black uh, glasses to talk about her ordeal. What I noted in the different interviews she gave to the media was how discussion of her rape was downplayed and articulated as part of violent African cultural norms, similar to female circumcision, similar to henna, similar to veiling, and to slavery and tribalism. And there is a reason, of course, for telling Halima's story in this way. So constructing Halima's narrative in a way familiar to uh, Western audiences' understanding of African suffering renders it more credible and legible as requiring the application of human rights and humanitarian laws. Indeed, Halima's story and its rendering in Tears of the Desert, which has been translated into 30 languages, facilitated her passage into and through the otherwise inaccessible corridors of media corporation and policymakers and granted her the often cabracious recognition of both national and global citizenship affiliation in the West. But an important question emerges here when we read such stories. What does this singular feminized story leave untold about the complex context of its production when we read Sudan's contemporary history. So in the context of the Sudan, and since the Islamists came to power in the 80s, Sharia moral codes, Sharia rules, uh, have presented a new model for national identity, linked to a pan-Islamist transnational solidarity. At the same time, many transnational actors and activists, including those who are in the opposition, um, have relied on the circulation of narratives of ethnic and gender violence in their alliances and contestation of the Islamist state. So for Sudanese state actors, uh, these alliances with different Muslim countries uh, 
help them assert the sovereignty of the Islamist state. And for those in the opposition, Western, trans, uh, Western based alliances enabled them to insert themselves in an imagined legal and moral uh, uh, order in order to envision uh, an inclusive nation state. So the story of Halima, for example, highlights the tension and clash among these dominant narratives of transnational affiliations endorsed by the Islamist and their human rights and humanitarian rivals. Now the problems of these two dominant visions is that they both work through assimilation and or exclusion of other Sudanese secular visions. Sudanese activists in the Sudan and in the diaspora have contested and re-articulated these narratives to highlight their own marginal positions as political opponents in the Sudan and as exiled migrants seeking safe transnational abuts. And I'm going to give you just another story, the counter narrative to this, to illustrate this point. Okay. So, can I see? Am I doing well on time? Okay. So the second story goes like this. On May 30th, 2009, Mahasin, a Sudanese community activist who lives in Virginia, invited me and another friend to meet in Maryland with Sana Al Amin. Sana is a young Sudanese woman who was subject to severe burns on her face and body in the Sudan in 2005. Now the story of the violence committed against Sana circulated quickly in national and international media, but was not picked up by Western-based human rights and humanitarian groups who celebrated the case of Halima Bashir. Sana's case was picked up and mobilized by a different group of secular Sudanese activists in the Sudan and in the diaspora who also used her case to point to what they called the complicity of the Sudanese state in perpetuating the violence of culture and tradition. So unlike the story of Halima, the story of Sana represent a northern, northern story, and I'll tell you what I mean by northern story. She was born and raised in a small town in central Sudan. So she is considered to be an Arab, Muslim, Northern Sudanese, according to the identity politics that framed the conflicts in South Sudan and in Darfur. So as a young Northern Sudanese, Sana is a member of a new generation of youth who grew up under the Islamist regime. Her discontent with her marriage took a terrible turn when she resisted and escaped to her parents' house. Unfortunately, this form of resistance was an affront to her husband, who tricked one of her brothers into helping him win Sana back. Now, the husband used a well-known cultural religious practice of curing sicknesses with blessed water. We call it mehaya, that blessed water. So in Sana's case, her husband claimed to get the blessed water from a renowned local healer and then convinced the brother to throw the liquid over Sana's face as she slept. Not realizing that the mehaya, the blessed water, was actually phosphoric acid, the brother did what he was told, and Sana's face and other body parts suffered third degree burns. 
So like Halima's story, Sana's story is also a production of a journalist. The Sudanese journalist, his name is Dayal Ballan, one of the chief editors of a Royal Am, uh, a prominent, uh, he is one of the chief editors of a Royal Am, one of Sudan's prominent newspaper. He picked up the story and published it under the journal's humanitarian section. It's called Safhat al Tahqiqat al Insaniya, so in Arabic. Um, so after the publication of Sana's story, many news outlets circulated it, especially Arab news media. Soon after that, Sana was airlifted from Sudan to the United Arab Emirates and then to the United States through a generous humanitarian grant from Sheikha Fatna bint Mubarak, the widow of late Sultan Zaid of United Arab Emirates. Sheikha Fatna is also known as the mother of Emirates, Umm al Amarat. She is also the head of the Emirates Women's Union and the honorary president of the Red Crescent, which is a well known humanitarian organization in the Muslim world. When Sana arrived in the United States, she was officially received by the Emirate ambassador there. And later, members of the Sudanese community were involved in her reception. I attended many fundraising uh, concert uh, sponsored by uh, artists and community members in Virginia in support of her case. Uh, for instance, uh, in this uh, one event, which bore the slogan, Min agli sana wa hatta akhir nisa, for sana until we liberate the last woman, it was a great demonstration of unity and solidarity among community activists in Virginia, who spoke about violence against women in the Sudan and how to devise strategies to combat it. I later met Sana and followed her lengthy medical recovery after she arrived in the United States. Now, the story of Sana is not the first of its kind, of course. Tragically, numerous women have suffered such attacks by their lovers, fiancés, and husbands, and their stories occasionally surface in the media, highlighting increasing incidents of violence against women in urban and rural settings in the Sudan. Furthermore, crimes of retaliation by phosphoric acid are not confined to women. In a few cases, uh, in other few cases that have also uh, received media attention, acid has been used in revenge between male business partners. So why Sena? Why Sena and the focus on this different kind of violence against women? In Halima's story, we see more emphasis on sexual violence. So why Sana's story was picked up and talked about differently here? The answer is that the focus on violence against women here highlight an important global transformation. It shows how the language of gender-based violence, how it travels, and how it shapes the practices of many NGOs working on women's issues in the Sudan and in Africa in general. Many feminists in the Sudan told me that their agendas have shifted in recent years to include gender-based violence to conform to the United Nations feminist agendas and to draw funding for their campaigning missions. So for the UN and other transnational organization, gender-based violence became a salient political category in the 80s and 90s to describe various forms of violence against women. Although other kinds of violence are acknowledged in this international feminist agenda, attention is often given to sexual violence and not to other kinds of gender violence and other kinds of gender discrimination. So Sana's case gave some feminists 
some Sudanese feminists and activists a chance to highlight this other kind of violence as counter response to the master narrative of sexual violence. Indeed, after the production and circulation of Sana's case, several Sudanese feminist journalists wrote about Sana's case, arguing that a new culture of violence is being nurtured by the current regime. They called for revisions of the legal codes and the personal status laws um, that, that governs uh, issues of marriage and issues of divorce. Um, they, many of them argue that in the existing personal status laws, uh, women are granted some liberties, but are still subject to male patriarchy and authority. As a woman, Sana is subject to male authority, but her family is also subject to economic marginalization that exacerbate cultural biases against women. And the org arguments went on and on. So what is also significant about Sana's case is how transnational activists used it to give a different meaning to this word, humanity and to this idea of social care. So Sana's case enabled many Sudanese uh, social actors and activists in the Sudan and in the diaspora to look toward, you know, one interview, uh, as one interviewee told me, to look at the, their culture of aid and support. Thaqafat al wal nafir. Nafir is a word that is used to refer to how people can come together and help each other in times of crisis. So it helped them to kind of reflect on this kind of culture, to bring it to the fore. Uh, so this brand of humanitarianism, you know, the Nafir, for inist instance, enables activists and community members in the Sudan and abroad to reflect on their own cultural practices and to craft a response that both critique and celebrate these cultural forms and these cultural uh, ideas of solidarity. And here are just two slides to, um, to show you what I mean by reinterpreting social care and reviving this nafir structure of feeling. Because humanitarianism is about, you know, uh, kind of appealing to, this, uh, to our emotions, yeah? We have to come together and help each other. Um, and here is one uh, Nafir event uh, in, in uh, Virginia to help uh, victims of uh, Nile flood in Khartoum. So they come together uh, and, and fundraise for those. Here is a, another one. So uh, in the case of Sana, uh, uh, many feminist journalists and interviewees in Khartoum and the United States, uh, as I said, mobilized Nafir to nurture you know, this kind of, of, um, of humanitarianism or humanitarian um, idea. Um, so what I wanted to say by bringing this to the fore is that it is this kind of, uh, or this uh, different understanding of humanity and social care with its intersecting Islamic and other communal forms, such as nafir uh, and zakah, for instance, that many social actors and activists invoke in their attempt to critique the practices of the state and to claim a neutral space that allows for the reinterpretation of gender, uh, ethnicity, and racial differentiation. But, of course, I have to come here with a critique, right? But um, as anthropologists have long uh, pointed out, our feelings are hardly removed from various webs of power and political economies. These communal models, like the master narrative of humanitarianism, assumes a po an apolitical stance that centers the politics of feeling as a strategy to contest the withdrawal of the state, taking for granted the classist position of the giver. Sena herself, for instance, succumbed to this politics when she explains to me 
that the conditions of her humanitarian grant do not allow her to talk about politics because the Sheikha was so kind to her. So through these unequal relations of gift giving and social care that naturalize poverty and other kinds of violence, new relations of bondage are created that, whether intentionally, intentionally or not, silence other political interpretations and critique. So the elision of unequal class relations, for instance, adds new injury to Sana and Halima's bodies by manipulating their vulnerabilities as a site of debate to heal a nation built apart in different ideological directions. So when Sana unveiled her face to the media, many recognized her as a role model, as someone courageous, using her story to teach a lesson to future generations. Her story also told a different humanitarian lesson that aims at healing injuries, albeit while concealing the politics of reg regional alliances, militarism, and competition over power and resources. Despite the similarities of Sana and Halima's stories, Halima's story sent a different message. None of my interlocutors identified the real woman behind the pseudonym Halima, but many recognized her story. One interviewee told me that he knew about her and that she had returned to the Sudan. Others told me that she's still married to the Darfurian rebel leader and lives with her family in London, though I was not able to verify these stories. Halima's story, uh, Halima story represents a resistance story of a Darfurian woman who sought alliances with a different kind of humanitarianism, a brand that to date remains in tension with the Islamist vision of sovereignty and governance in the Sudan. So before I conclude, I just want to say that it's very important to note that these master narratives and counter narratives all surfaced in the media at important historical moments. They emerged at the height of transnational activist mobilization against war atrocities in southern Sudan and in Darfur. They also emerged in the post 9 -11 and the war on terror and right after the signing of the peace agreement in 2005. They made headline, headline news when attacks on Western humanitarian workers in Darfur were mounting, when the Doha negotiation for Darfur were uncertain, and when Sudan's unity was at stake. Such stories uh, of suffering refugees especially women and children, as I talk about them in the book, provided a gendered lens through which to debate Sudan's political conflicts and to debate the legitimacy of the Islamist regime and also to debate the legitimacy of and the place of Sudan in, in the global humanitarian order. So I argue that these different processes and the, these different mobilization provided the fertile ground and, and marked the right time for the separation of the country into two nation states, Sudan and South Sudan. So just as women's bodies have served as sites of national debates and negotiations, so to have the tensions dividing Sudan blade out on women's bodies. Sana and Halima's stories, for instance, reveal how national and transnational politics of sovereignty, of hu humanity, and of rights collided over women's injured bodies before the division 
of the country. Thank you. I'm really curious about the word branding. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the significance of that choice of word just a little bit more. So I think the branding comes from um, choosing what conflict to highlight. Yeah, especially because you know Sudan is a diverse country, uh, and conflicts over you know uh, national identity and citizenship has been all over the place. Uh, so um, you know, people in Eastern Sudan, for instance, have been resisting this kind of uh, you know uh, exclusion from being part of this uh, Sudanese nation state. Um, people in northern Sudan also have, you know, certain, uh, you know, uh, grievances and contestation. Um, so, um, so there was some sort of privileging of Darfur. Uh, not to say that atrocities didn't happen there, of course. Um, there were a lot of atrocities that happened there. But to kind of focus on one conflict, I felt that um, uh, that divided the country more than kind of thinking about the country as uh, a one thing, you know? So like um, it, it presented a, a kind of um, conundrum, so to speak, to how to uh, capitalize on uh, diversity to bring together instead to select, you know, like one ethnicity and to kind of highlight it and it becomes about just one, one place in the Sudan. The same that you know, same happened in South Sudan, which ended, you know, uh, or ultimately led to the division of the country. So, what does that division mean when we think about the nation state? You know, are we just going to give Darfurian also another state? Are we going to give Eastern Sudanese another state? So, what does this mean when we think about the nation state itself? Um, and when we think about issues of diversity, that's, I think it confronts everybody, and not just Sudan, right? So these issues are everywhere. So how do we capitalize on diversity to bring together instead of to fragment? So I think the branding comes from this. I want to ask the question, what was the larger geopolitical uh, fallout from this? And who had the greatest interest in highlighting Darfur? Darfur yeah. and excluding others. Well, I think I think a human rights activist uh, and humanitarian uh, activist uh, and their alliances in in the diaspora kind of fell into the trap of identity politics somehow. You know, I mean, their intention might be very good, of course, but then. I felt that by kind of capitalizing on identity politics and kind of uh, highlighting the trope of suffering, you also excluded other people. You didn't think about the future of the Sudan. And I, I'm not sure if you, uh, you are all following what's happening in the Sudan now. I mean, there are demonstrati demonstrations that has been going on for almost 40, 40 days. And these are basically the secular, the people who had the same kind of politics with Darfur and with South Sudanese. And they wanted a unity. They wanted a, a, a united Sudan. They were against, uh, you know, the South going away or Darfur going away. So what I notice now when these activists, you know, are claiming the street and chanting, they chant for, we are all Darfur, for instance. Or what happened to the South? Because the South also plunged into war and, and uh, ethnic uh, you know, divisions because we still were not thinking about diversity in the South. The South is not just Dinka and Noor. There are other ethnic groups as well. So the, what's happening in the South is also due to this idea of just focusing on two ethnic groups, for instance, instead of bringing everybody in. Yeah? Can I just have one of them? What about the natural resources in terms of who has the most gas and, and other things? How is that playing out to contribute to this? Well, you know, with the division of the country, yeah, the oil went with the south. So 
that actually augmented the economic um, hardship in northern Sudan right now and in other parts of the Sudan. So yes, I mean, the, the focus on wealth and division of resources, um, you know, has also been central to this uh, contestation. Because, you know, people in Darfur are saying, you know, we're not getting our fair share. Most of the wealth is focused or concentrated in, uh, in the north or in Khartoum, right? How has the Me Too movement here had any impact on patriarchal societies in Africa? That's a very good question. <laughs> when I think about it, ah, so, yeah, because it also focuses on uh, violence against women, but also uh, sexual violence. You know, I think, so, what I want to say here is that, um, you know, these issues are very important, uh, and um, not just important in themselves, but it's important to highlight them at certain um, historical moments. But again, they kind of fragment the women's issues somehow, you know, because women's issues are not just about violence or harassment. So I think we need to also look at the root causes of gender disparities and gender discrimination, like, and see why this kind of this kind of violence against women are taking place in the in the first place, right? So I, you know, it's good to highlight that, but also for us as feminists and women who are concerned with these issues, is to go back and think, what about other issues? Why are we leaving uh, them behind? Because at certain points, it seems like very sensational. You know, like in, in the case of the Sudan, when the Darfur uh, issue came to the fore, it, ca it became all about sexual violence, sexual violence, and then when people sat down and tried to find solution for the conflict, suddenly it disappeared, as if sexual violence is gone. No, but it's still there. And other discrimination are also there. So we need to always kind of have this, uh, you know, have this like, you know, highlight these issues, but think about the root causes of gender disparities. Yeah. It seemed interesting to me that uh, the way we discuss humanitarian actors, it's like we have regional actors um, more or less like selecting narratives to move forward to, to more or less forward like what I would call like a regional political interest and then like a global humanitarian that tries to translate these narratives into something that other people can understand not necessarily with any regional political interest yeah. like is there some kind of mechanism between regional and global humanitarian that allows there to be like a strategic aim of humanitarian uh, of humanitarian communication or advocacy, yeah. or is it more, or is it more just an accident of people being excited about interesting stories coming out of regional areas? Very good question because I remember when because Kuluni was very big about Sudan, and other celebrities were also very big about Sudan, and it seems to me they were talking to American media and American public. And that irritated the activists, Sudanese activists who were working hard on the ground. It's like, what happened to us? You know, we, you are representing Sudan as if there is nobody there. Nobody who's angry, nobody who's actually fighting, and nobody who's doing activists since the colonial time, right? So, and I read some of their, um, you know, they sent some, um, you know, counter responses to Colony on the Sudanese media. And it says basically that, you know, we really acknowledge what you're doing, but why don't you come and sit with us? So we can actually come uh, up with something, you know, uh, that really represents what is happening in the Sudan. Because they saw their representation as very divisive. You know, so, uh, and again, you know, it takes the agency uh, from people who are actually working there. And if you just, you know, look at what is happening in the Sudan now, these are the act activists who are now just taken uh, out, you know, taken to the street and resisting. And they have been doing this for a long time. I mean, Sudan is uh, famous for two big revolutions in the 60s and in the 80s that toppled, you know, two dictatorships uh, in, in, um, in the country. So they kind of, yeah, they, they think that this is just kind of coming.
over their heads. <laughs> thank you for this question. It's very good. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think I'll sign this up. Uh, um, um, we really need this kind of, uh, of uh, presentations uh, uh, where we can get actually the complexities of the different issues, different um, um, agents, agencies uh, participating uh, and shaping uh, the, what's going on on the ground, what we get at uh, uh, the national level or international level usually is uh, uh, putting so many stories together and uh, simplifying it. And those of us who know and deal with uh, the complex stories uh, at the community level uh, are sometimes frustrated uh, uh, and uh, difficulty really explaining and, and getting the story out. And, and the way, just you said, uh, or the way maybe certain um, uh, regions, uh, uh, certain issues are privileged and um, uh, get more attention. Yeah. Uh, also, in fact, uh, uh, violence exists in so many places, uh, and so horrible, so many horrible things taking place in so many places. But those stories don't get out well, uh, and uh, we wonder why. And um, sometimes we, we explain, we um, attempt to explain. Sometimes we don't. So uh, these are really very, very uh, uh, important issues. Uh, if we had time, we could really ask more and uh, you could help us explain. Uh, but anyhow, we don't have that much time and uh, very grateful to your presentation. Thank At you for this uh, moment, uh, I'll call upon uh, our part uh, to uh, say um, words of thanks to, and go to the Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's great. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you stayed beyond the time that was specified, but the message was important. We know a lot about branding in the United States. Uh, we've seen the caravan coming. <laughs> we've, I mean, I, I, th I think the title was very fitting for most of us, and we know the media has its own spin on so many stories. Yes. And we're used to thinking of human stories, particularly stories by women, yes. as the honest, we're getting the real thing. Yes. But everybody can be manipulated. Exactly. So exactly. we thank you so much, thank for, you your, so much for, for, for your messages and, and, and information. I just want to give a shout out to my friends from the community. And I, I know that uh, Dr. Abu Bakr has spoken to the, the um, administrators, the, the professors, the faculty, the people inside, inside the house. But hallelujah for those of you <laughs> who've come from outside. Great to have you here. You know, They put in the program closer remarks. So I, I kept wondering what that meant. And I decided that uh, closing remarks would mean what message, what key message do you take home? And that message is this. Somebody asked here, um, how does the Me Too movement resonate in Africa? The same, the same question was asked uh, of um, Nawal El Sadawi, the Egyptian ultra-feminist writer, in London three weeks ago. The same question, yes. And she said, when something in the Western world happens, it makes history. But when something in the non-Western world happens, it doesn't make history. She said, as far back as 1965, when she was a medical student at Columbia University, she had started talking about gender issues. But nobody listened. In fact, she said that fellow students, American women, laughed at her. So her answer to that question is, it's too late. It says an African had long ago talked about it in America in very strong words, and people laughed at her. 
Now, this is Africa Week. But this is African American History Month. What we are doing here is something that people acknowledge is real, but leave it at that point. Some historians have said that African American history is African history suspended for 400 years. Suspended, but not obliterated. So, Today, no American, no history of America will be complete and accurate without the inclusion of the African American experience. And no Af uh, world history will be complete without the inclusion of African history. So, what we're saying here, and I'm glad the Archie uh, did is here. Um, please, we're saying to you of inflamed, tear the wall down that makes our students feel that there is nothing in Africana studies that's worth part of their education here. I'm not asking you to uh, read my lips, <laughs> but in actual fact, if you of inflamed puts its signature behind the invitations next year, we won't need this space. We need twice this space. So there, there is that mistaken illusion or belief that in African studies, yes, really, how is it, how are the studies there related to my future career as a lawyer, as a scientist? as um, an engineer. My first doctor had her first degree in African-American study, African studies. But she has her PhD in public health. So do help us to put out the story that this is a story not just for people of my skin, but for everybody. It's knowledge. Look at the dance we saw this afternoon. Ghanaian and Nigerian origins. And look at the play we, that's just ended. My Children, My Africa. Many stories, many books have been written about South Africa during apartheid and after apartheid. Arthur forgot captured the real rea the, the reality of what uh, pre-apartheid, post-apartheid, and post-apartheid actually means. So it's best when you hear the stories from the people themselves. Africa and African and, Afri and African American societies have passed the, 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 the stage where their stories are told for them by other people. This gives us an opportunity. Look at what we've been exposed to today. Um, so there's a Nigerian proverb message saying that says, stop looking up there in the sky for what is here on the ground. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs> for coming. Uh, um, the celebration continues. Uh, storytelling continues. Uh, we'll have another uh, occasion tomorrow. I'll be speaking uh, on Ethiopia uh, from 11 to 12.20 in 3.10 French Hall. Weather cooperating. I invite all of you to be there uh, tomorrow as well. So that will continue the celebration and the storytelling. Thank you. Thank you for coming.